everyone. Welcome to this evening's uh, edition of our 2024 Follow the River Lecture Series. It is our first of 2024, and we're very, very pleased to be here with you all and to welcome Mary Missler. Uh, my name is Erin Boss. I work as the Education Program Coordinator here at the Hudson River Maritime Museum. Um, I'd like to thank our generous sponsor, Ronda Savings Bank. And I would also like to thank my amazing colleagues. Uh, here with us tonight, we have Carrie Gallagher, Director of Education at HRMM. We have, <laughs> hi Carrie. We have Jonathan Kaufman, also Education Program Manager at HRMM. We have Leslie Drojak, Intrepid Museum Volunteer, a regular in our lecture series. And we have Jack Loesch, Senior at SUNY New Paltz, our fantastic museum education intern with us this semester. Before we begin, if I could take this moment to ask you to pull out your cell phones and please turn them to silent, a good reminder to do so. And some quick logistical information for you all. Um, our restrooms are undergoing a fabulous renovation. So we do have one restroom available in the hallway. Um, it is an all gender restroom and rest assured there are stalls that lock. Um, and please take note as well of the exits. We have the way that you came in, you're welcome to leave that way. We also have an exit actually over to the side behind where Jonathan is standing. Um, there are additional exits if you go down the hallway out of the wooden boat school. We would like that the building stay in one piece ideally, but I suppose if we're exiting in an emergency, you never know. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. The Hudson River Maritime Museum is a 501c3 not-for-profit. We do not receive funds from the city, state, or federal government, except for periodic and competitive project-based grants. So just thanking again our generous sponsor, Rondout Savings Bank, for their sponsorship. Um, and also thank you all for your contributions and for supporting this lecture series. Please note that we are video recording this lecture. The video recording device is here on the computer, so it is not capturing the audience. But the question and answer session that will follow Mary's lecture will be included in the recording. So if you ask a question, ideally that audio will be included in this recording. We include the following water and land acknowledgement in our public programming. The Hudson River Maritime Museum is located on the Rondout Creek, part of Lenape Hoking, the traditional home of the Lenape people. We recognize the painful history of forced removal, dispossession, cultural suppression, and genocide of indigenous peoples, by collaborating with present-day Lenape communities, culture bearers, and scholars, we hope to actively work to improve our exhibits, public programs, and educational resources, and help everyone better understand this important history. Our next lecture in the Follow the River lecture series is scheduled for Wednesday, May 8th, here in the Wooden Boat School. Um, the lecture is titled Silver Dollar Girls, the Women Pilots of World War II, in which author Margaret de Benedetto shares her personal historical novel based on her own mother's story as a World War II military pilot. This evening's lecture, in honor of Women's History Month, is Ladies of the Valley, Women of the Hudson Valley's Great Estates, and we have our amazing presenter, Mary Missler. Mary Missler has lived in the Hudson Valley area for most of her life and has worked as an administrator and teacher and has volunteered as a docent at the home of Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Vanderbilt Mansion, and the Wilderstein Historic Site. I also have information that Mary will be resuming tours at Wilderstein Historic Site this summer, so if you don't get enough of her this evening, I encourage you to make a visit just across the river in Rhinebeck. Um, and with that, please welcome Mary Missler. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out this evening. I'm very appreciative of you all coming out. And it was a beautiful day and it's a lovely evening. So thank you for that. And I want to thank the Hudson River Maritime Museum for inviting me to be part of their lecture series, Follow the River. It's a really wonderful series and I'm very happy to be part of it. So one of the reasons I wrote my book, <clears throat> excuse me, was because I've always been fascinated by the beautiful mansions that line the Eastern shore of the Hudson River. And growing up in Dutchess County, my parents would take us to visit those places very often. I think some of my siblings would say perhaps a little too often, but I really love those places. And um, after I retired, I became a docent, as Erin said, at the home of FDR and at the Vanderbilt Mansion and Wilderstein. 
and oh my god I was all right and I found that the women played much larger roles in the operation of those estates than I had realized. And as I did more research, I found their stories to be so compelling, I decided to put my research into a book. Women were expected to take over running the estates when their husbands or fathers were away. And these wealthy landowning men were often away, involved in business, politics, or at times wars. But when the men returned, the women were expected to go back to their domestic roles. Women were considered primarily caretakers of their husbands, their children, their extended families, and their servants. Now, the women's rights movement and social upheavals of the 19th century caused major shifts, but change did not happen in an even progression. Personality and family attitudes made a difference. Some women, schooled to care for their own, were inclined to be cautious and stay within their own families and social circle. Others ventured out, some tentatively and some eagerly, to participate in the larger world. But since this is Women's History Month, I thought I would talk about several of these women and how changes in society affected them. And before I begin, I want to acknowledge the important role the indigenous people of the Hudson Valley played. But for my book, my research really focused on the Dutch and British settlers and their descendants in the valley. And also in my book, I do acknowledge that much of the early work on these estates was dependent on both the labor of un enslaved people and of tenant farmers, from which these wealthy families benefited unfairly. But with that, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. So I'm going to... Okay. And these are the estates that are mentioned in my book. Now, the construction of these houses ranged from the colonial period into the Gilded Age. The earliest estates were modeled on European manners, and the women were expected to be caretakers not only of their families, but of the workers on the estates and in the surrounding villages. They were like the medieval lady of the manor or lady bountiful. And although this sounds strange, in the days before other social supports, they were the main source of help for these families. And this actually continued into the early 20th century. Now, these are the women, the ladies of the valley. And they lived in these estates. And my book does have a chapter on each of them. But I also included stories about their mothers and daughters as well. And as you can see, there are many Livingstons. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the women, like Margaret Beekman Livingston, were very comfortable in running their estates, but some, especially during the Victorian era, were so sheltered from the realities of life that they were totally unprepared for this. For example, if they were suddenly widowed, as was Sarah Delano Roosevelt and also Eleanor's grandmother, Mary Livingston Ludlow Hall, they had to teach themselves the operation of these estates very, very quickly, but they did. So to give you some historical perspective, I'll start with the earliest of the ladies. This is Alida Schuyler Livingston, and this is believed to be her wedding portrait. And as you can see, she's dressed in European Renaissance style, very expensive clothing, which would have been imported. She lives in Rensselaerwick, which is the patroonship around Albany, and she comes from a very wealthy family. Her father is Philip Schuyler. He had a trading post in Beverwick, which is city of Albany now, and her mother is the daughter of the governor of the patroonship. So at the time that Alida was born, Dutch laws actually allowed women to own property. But in 1664, the English took over. And by the time Alida was an adult, women had fewer rights and their husbands owned all their property. And this wouldn't change until 1848. So especially in her case, a good marriage was critical. She married twice, actually. She first married the Reverend Nicholas Van Rensselaer, which was probably an arranged marriage. He was the son of the patroon, and he was 40 and she was 19. Um, the marriage was um, short. He died only three years later, and they had no children. So about eight months later, she married Robert Livingston, who had been the personal secretary to Nicholas. They married um, in 1678, and he was a very different man. He was dashing and ambitious. He came from a Scottish family that were descended from the Earls of Callender, and they had nine children, six of whom survived. 
But both Alida and her husband were very ambitious and they were seeking more lands. And so Robert was able to procure lands for them. He got a land grant from the uh, governor for land north of Albany, but then in 1686, he got a major, <clears throat> excuse me, a major land grant on the Hudson. And this was property that was, would now be considered most of Southern Columbia County. It's property extended from the Hudson all the way over to Massachusetts. And I will show you what's left of the manor house that he built there. <laughs> Not much. This is, <laughs> this is a pretty decrepit road, <laughs> historic marker, but um, the house was demolished in 1800. And um, as you can see, it was on the Hudson River and the roll of Jansen Kill. And it was the house, it was built in 1699 and by the first Lord of the manor, Robert Livingston and wife Alida on land grant of 1686. Now, Robert fashioned himself as the Lord of the manor. Um, he has kind of aspirations to nobility. So he was going to create a feudal manor on this land. And um, so what he did was he built a manor house. It was not um, elaborate. It was kind of a fortress. It was made of stone and timber and it sat on the hill behind this sign overlooking the Hudson. And um, he built a grist mill and a bakery and a brewery and a sawmill. So it was going to be a self-contained estate. And so um, I will show you the landing. This is owned by a boat club now. So this dock is not original, of course. <laughs> Neither is the Amtrak trestle. <laughs> but this is the role of Jansen Kill coming in from the left flowing from the east into the Hudson, which is, of course, running north-south. And, of course, you see the beautiful view of the Catskills. This harbor was much deeper back in their day. So they were able to bring in their sailing ships and load and unload their cargo here and bring it into the manor. So once Robert got all of this built, um, he kind of left. Um, he left Alida to run the place. Uh, she was about 45 years old at this time. But Robert was very much interested in making more deals. So he spent most of his time down in New York City and mm -hmm. over in London, and he was always trying to find ways of improving their status. So she ran the manor and she actually had to supervise the whole operation of this place. She had tenant farmers that she was landlord to, and she was in charge of making sure that the crops were produced and then shipped down to the city where he would sell them or export them. And then she would order from him imported goods that she would sell locally or up in Albany. So she is running between the manor house and her home in Albany. Her mother is still living in Albany. She's got relatives there. And she's educating her six children in the process of all of this. <laughs> so she's a busy woman, um, but she's very strong. Um, actually, there's a story that her mother was um, famous for her arm wrestling. Uh, she <laughs> apparently <laughs> was used to take on all comers in their, uh, in a tavern in Albany. But um, Alida, <laughs> Alida was also, though, very concerned about her children making good marriages. And this was a theme that will continue throughout. Um, she made sure that they married respectable people and that the people were wealthy. And um, if she didn't like the partner they were proposing, that marriage didn't happen. But Robert, meanwhile, this is Robert in London. Um, he is dressed in his lordly outfit here. Um, he's got the wig and he's got the robes. And um, he is over there making deals. Um, and he becomes connected with a lot of the nobility in, uh, in London. Um, but he is able to make a friend in a man over there who... Um, later came to New York, and that was a man named William Kidd. And one of his deals is that he and William Kidd proposed to buy a ship together, and they involved Lord Bellamont. They come back to New York, and they buy this ship, and Lord Bellamont is a partner. He is the governor of New York at that time. And they're going to send William Kidd out on voyages. Now, William Kidd is actually, we know him as Captain Kidd. So he's going to do what he does best, which is piracy. <laughs> so he goes out the first voyage on this ship. And unfortunately, he attacks a ship that has an English captain. So the British government is not happy about this. They haul him back to London. They try him for piracy and they hang him in 1701. 
But somehow, miraculously, Robert escapes from all of this. Robert is a very lucky man in many ways, but he's managed to somehow evade any implication in this whole thing. So <clears throat> he has another scheme now, though. Um, he proposes to the British government that he will take with um, a group of a German uh, refugees. They're called Palatines. They're from the Rhineland Palatinate. And they have been displaced from Germany by the war of Spanish succession. So he says he will bring them over to his manor and he will have them draw tar from his pine trees and ship's masts for the British Navy. And so the government agrees they will provide the funding for these people. And so they ship over about 2,600 German immigrants and they arrive at the manor. But it was at that point that Robert discovers he has the wrong kind of pine trees. <laughs> so none of this is going to work. Um, so um, the government, after about a year, they realize that they're not getting the shipments that they expected. And they stop and they pull funding from him. They say, we're not paying you. We're not getting what we bargained for. So Robert turns to Alida, who has been caring for these people all along. And he says, stop feeding them. We can't afford it. We don't get any money for this. We can't do this. Well, all of the to her credit says, no, I am going to not let these people starve. I'm going to continue to feed these people, their families, their children and families. So she ends up having to go out and buy grains to grind for their bread. And she ends up buying lots of supplies, depleting their resources in kind of trying to keep these people alive. About 1712, a lot of these people give up and they leave. Um, and Alida doesn't stop them. Uh, some of them go down to the Beekman Patent in Southern Duchess. Some go up to Schoharie County and some go over to Pennsylvania where they join some earlier German settlers. And this group of people over there become known as the Pennsylvania Dutch. So um, she actually though has to then create or increase production on the manor to keep them from losing their land to their creditors at this point. And so over the next several years, she does that and she actually saves the manor from this disastrous scheme. And I want to show you all at about 1717, this portrait is done. She um, is looking like she's seen a few things. I, she, she's a very no nonsense looking woman. She's very practical, but she's very, um, you can see she's wearing a very plain dress, very simple, very different from Robert's style, it, it appears. She's holding a prayer book. And um, in her later years, well, 1720 or thereabouts, she starts to fail in her health. And she asks Robert to please come back to the manor finally to be with her. Um, he does return in about the last year of her life. And they spend that year together on the manor. Uh, he dies, well, she died in 1727. He died a year later in 1728. And in his will, they left the manor house and the lands north of the role of Jansen to their elder son, Philip. They carved out the lands below the role of Jansen kill for their son, Robert, who they had a fondness for. And so Robert was able to build Claremont on those lands to the south. And so that's the beginning of the division in the Livingston family. They're called the Claremont branch and the uh, manor branch. And that goes on for generations. So I want to show you beautiful Claremont. This is Claremont from the east side. This is the rear of the house. Um, this is a much bigger house than it was originally. It was originally a two-story house, but it was added on to, of course, over the years. But you notice the house is facing the river. In those days, those houses would all face the river because that's where the transportation was. The guests would come up on boats. And so um, this house is has a beautiful view of the Caskills, as you can see. And it was built in 1740 by Robert, who was the son of Alida and, and Robert. Now I have to mention, uh, as I mentioned, Robert again, the Livingston family has a predilection for the name Robert. And you're going to run into Robert, Robert, Robert through every generation in every family. And for women, it's Margaret. So um, just be prepared. Uh, it's a nightmare for genealogists, but. <laughs> But this is the riverside. This is the side that faces their guests as they approach the house. And I want to show you Margaret Beekman Livingston. She is the matriarch of Claremont. And she is a woman who is very wealthy, as you can see. Uh, she, this is her wedding portrait. 
Uh, her father was Henry Beekman. He was a landowner who owned the Beekman patent. He owned land around Rhinebeck and um, he owned land over in Ulster County. Her mother was Janet Livingston, of course, in Livingston, um, but she was from the Albany branch of the Livingston family. She was a, a descendant of one of the uh, children of the nephew of the Robert that was in Albany earlier. <laughs> so she um, is marrying Robert R. Livingston, the grandson of Alida, and she marries him in 1742. Now, this Robert becomes very active in politics. Um, he becomes a judge of the New York Supreme Court. He's in the assembly, and he's often out and about on political business. But they do have a very happy marriage. They have 10 children, and she's a very loving mother. She calls her home, Claremont, the house of peace and love. And she also has a home down in New York City. Most of these families will have a city home as well for the winter months. And she uh, has a house on Pearl Street, which becomes a salon. She's Her personality is so magnetic that people come and she entertains a lot of uh, politicians and army officers and generally just society people in New York City. And this gives her an opportunity to have her children meet prospective spouses, which again is always a big concern. This is where her daughter Janet actually married General Richard Montgomery or met General Richard Montgomery, who mar they married and she later developed Montgomery Place. But um, before the revolution, she's used to running the estate because her father-in-law and her husband are both always involved in politics and out and about. And the Livingstons surprisingly sided with the Patriots during the revolutionary period. And so they were very, very busy. A lot of times they'd be over in Kingston or down in New York City or up in Albany. And she was running the estate and dealing with um, all of the children and all of that. But in 1775, she had a terrible year. That summer, her father died, her father-in-law died, and her husband died all within months of each other. So she was left bereft. She loved her husband dearly. And she was running the estate then full-time from that point. She's about 51 years of age at that time. And I want to show you the view from Claremont. And this is looking southwest. You can see, of course, the Catskills. And um, this is important because in 1777, since the Livingstons were rebels, the British were coming up the Hudson and they were gonna burn the houses and barns of all the patriots or rebels. And Margaret got word of this. So she was able to pack up and she buried a lot of their valuables in their gardens. She packed their fa her family and servants and everybody onto wagons. And they started out for Salisbury, Connecticut, where she was going to shelter with her cousin. And I hate to say it, but his name was Robert Livingston. <laughs> anyway, but the story goes that as they were leaving, they could see the smoke of Kingston burning in the distance. So a scary time. So when they returned in 1778, Claremont was gone, but Margaret was determined to rebuild it. And so she knew there was a labor shortage. She couldn't get workers because of the war. So she called on Governor George Clinton to send her some help. Now, Governor Clinton sent her some continental soldiers who were hanging around Albany, apparently, and uh, they were able to build the house for her, rebuild it. And um, she was a very wealthy widow, so she did have a lot of political clout. And in this period, women did have, have some power. Um, so her first dinner guests in 1782, when the house reopened, was a couple named George and Martha Washington. So you could see she is very well connected. So this is Margaret, and this is in her middle years. This is a Gilbert Stewart portrait. This hangs in Claremont. It's a beautiful portrait, and she's she looks the way you think she is, I think. She's known as a generous and loving mother to her children and a fair employer. And um, in 1800, she did pass away, but her will freed all of her slaves and she left them incomes, annual incomes, as well as places to live. She arranged for that for them. And New York didn't end slavery till 1827, so she's a little ahead of her time. But also before she died, she divided all her properties, which were vast, and she divided them among all 10 of her children, not just the eldest son, which was typical. Her children and descendants then established many of the estates along the river. I will list them, there, there are many, 
Montgomery Place, Messina, Rokeby, Wilderstein, Ellerslie, Grasmere, Wildercliff, Linwood, and Statsburg, and more. So that was, this is one of Margaret's descendants. This is a granddaughter of Margaret. This is Margaret Lewis Livingston of Statsburg and of course, New York City. She is a very stylish society matron of the early 1800s, as you can see in her portrait here. She's wearing her jewelry and she's very nicely dressed. She has beautiful curly hair. And um, she was the daughter of Gertrude Livingston, who was one of Margaret's daughters. And her father was General Morgan Lewis. He was the son of Francis Lewis, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was also a very wealthy merchant. He lived down in Queens. So if you're familiar with Queens, you probably know Francis Lewis Boulevard. That was his. <laughs> so um, Francis Lewis, um, uh, sorry, uh, Morgan Lewis built Statsburg in 1792. And they lived there for many years, but they only had one child. Um, Gertrude and Morgan had this child, Margaret, and her father doted on her. He educated her as if she were a boy. He taught her all the curriculum that a boy would have in those days. She knew the classics. She knew Latin and Greek and French and math and accounting. He also told her all about the running of the estate. So she was very intelligent and a very competent woman. And her father um, loved her so much that um, his his wife had inherited 20,000 acres over in Delaware County. And Morgan would ride over there and just survey the property. He found a village there that he liked. So he decided to name it after his daughter. And you're going to guess the name of it, I hope. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yes, Margaretville, of course. Okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> Margaret married um, when she was 19, and she married a distant cousin, not surprisingly, from the Manor branch. He was Maturin Livingston. Now, Maturin was a lawyer by training, but um, he had also some political appointments, but he was not overly ambitious, it seems. He liked sports, he liked hunting, he liked social life, and he retired early. And so he was here in Statsburg running the estate also, they'd be down in the city at their house on Leonard Street. But um, he also was subject to depressions. And so when he had a depressive episode, Margaret would have to take over running the estate. And she was quite capable of doing that. But this was the Victorian era. And so women were expected to be at home. They were restricted to their domestic pursuits. And they were very rigid social rules. Margaret had 12 children the first in 1799 and the last in 1821. So for a period of 22 years, she's having children and taking care of them. So she being kind of confined to home devotes all of her energies and her considerable intelligence to raising these children. She is going to make sure that they are very well educated. She doesn't believe boarding schools are good enough. So she decides she's going to hire tutors and she hires and fires tutors and tries to make sure that they're teaching them with the latest methods. She reads up on teaching methods. She's an expert in that as well. And um, she also is very concerned about their health, of course, in those days. Um, she comes up with remedies to help the children when they're ill. And when one of them is sick, she'll sit up with them herself all night rather than have a servant do it. She's completely devoted to the children. But she is preparing them to enter society and to make sure they married well and well meant wealthy. <laughs> I hate to, that's true. <laughs> they were, um, they, they did get invited to all the best parties in New York. Um, and she was friends with people like Washington Irving and the Shermerhorns and the famous Joneses who they kept up with and the, <laughs> and the Astors and the Beekmans. And um, if you watch the Gilded Age program on TV, um, you have an idea of how the society worked. And that was a little later, but it's similar. Women had to be sure that their family was part of the best society because this was the way to ensure advantageous marriages. And this goes a long way to explaining why there were so many interfamily marriages, especially among the wealthy, I think. And distant cousins marrying was not unusual, especially among the Livingstons. So all of her children did marry. Um, one of them, though, unfortunately died at a relatively uh, young age. Alfred was became an alcoholic, but her daughters, Giddy and Mary, married two wealthy plantation owners in South Carolina, the Lowndes brothers. 
And her daughter, Angelica, married Alexander Hamilton's grandson. So she was really in the best society. <laughs> and this is Margaret in her later years. Um, this portrait also hangs at Statsburg, but um, I looked at it when I wrote the book as she's worried. She has these frown lines between her eyes and she's got the furrowed brow. But someone recently pointed out to me that she really just looks stern. So I leave it to you. I really think that I am kind of prejudiced toward her because I read a lot of her letters. I found a collection of her letters to her daughter. They run from 1826 to 1842. So I was able to digitize them and I annotated them and I put them in a little book called Mother to Daughter. But her letters show her daily life and her constant worry about everything. But she talks about her family mm -hmm. and all their problems and society and the gossip. She tells Giddy about the fashions that she has to follow and the latest books and theater in New York City. She's also telling Giddy about herbal remedies that she should use for her children. She's also giving her daughter advice on how to raise her children. And she's also taken time to correct Giddy's spelling and penmanship. <laughs> that is Margaret. So in her letters, about halfway through, she calls her, starts calling herself Grandma Grundy. Now, Grandma Grundy is a stock character in Victorian literature who is typically an older woman who is very rigid and fastidious about the rules of society. And so she's kind of joking about herself, but she says, I'm really becoming a Grandma Grundy now because she can't take the changes in society. She thinks things are getting too crazy. Like there's the waltz out there and people are doing this dance. And so she actually later confesses to Giddy that she's tired of the social scene and she wishes her younger daughters would hurry up and get married so she could stop attending all these balls and parties. So poor Margaret. And so you can decide yourself what you think of that portrait, but um, this is her Statsburg house, and this is the house of 1835. It doesn't look much like the Statsburg that we see today. Um, this house replaced a house that her parents built. That was a wood frame house. Margaret is said to have designed this house. So Margaret also had skills in architecture, apparently. And um, what had happened to the earlier house was the Livingstons had leases that nobody liked. They were very long-term leases, intergenerational leases, and people could never own their own property. So there's a lot of unrest, especially in Ulster and Delaware counties where they owned a lot of the land. So one night, the story goes that in January, uh, the river was frozen and a group of angry tenants crossed the river and torched the house. So fortunately, the family would have been down in their city home at that point. Mm. But Margaret, that was in 1832. So Margaret redesigns or designs this house and she makes it out of brick. And so uh, foresight. And so this is the 1835 house. And uh, this remained until 1895. And this house is the, now the Statsburg house facing the river. But you see the bowed windows in the front. That is still the original house. They didn't tear down Margaret's house. They built around it. Stanford White expanded the house. He added the upper floors and he added the wings. And this was to be for the Gilded Age. It had to be a much bigger and more impressive mansion for Gilded Age purposes. Her, this is Statsburg facing the river again. And this is the way it looks today. It was inherited by her daughter, her granddaughter, um, she Margaret left it to her son, Matron, and when he died in 1890, it was left to his daughter, Ruth Livingston Mills. And so she had Stanford White redesign the house. And this is Ruth. Now we're into the Gilded Age, totally. Um, this is Ruth, who was known to be a very competitive hostess. She was kind of a Grandma Grundy on steroids. She <laughs> she tried to restrict the society from the 400 of Mrs. Astor down to 150. She really thought nobody was really quite good enough. Um, she had married into a lot of money, though, too. She married Ogden Mills, who was the son of Darius Mills. He started the Bank of California during the gold rush. <clears throat> so lots of money. So she was able to redesign the house and she was able to have these extravagant parties, both here and, of course, in her Newport home. And she's actually said to be the model for Edith Wharton's Har or Heartless Hostess in the House of Mirth, Judy Trainer. 
Um, some of her family and friends said good things about her, but Edith Wharton does not. <laughs> so, but times were changing in the mid 19th century and many women had joined the abolition movement by now and the women's rights movement and also worked for urban reform. They were starting charitable institutions like foundling hospitals and orphanages and settlement houses in the city. But Ruth seemed to live a rather insular life. She stayed in her own social circles she was concerned with mostly exclusivity, and she, but she was devoted to her family and her mother and her husband and three children. She had two daughters and a son. But when she died, she notably doesn't leave money for charity. She leaves money to her family and some of the workers on her estate and her servants. So she's a little different from this woman, her neighbor. This is Louise Holmes Anthony Vanderbilt, and they were good friends. They had side-by-side -side houses at Newport. And I think that the reason that the um, Vanderbilts bought the house in Hyde Park was because um, Ruth had told them it was available and they liked to be close. So um, Ruth uh, Louise is very different from Ruth. She's very sweet and very kind and generous person. And you see her sitting here with her, Jack Russell. She loved dogs. Uh, she always kind of had a herd of little dogs around her. And she was involved in many charities. Her father had been a philanthropist, and she was very aware and concerned about the outside world. <clears throat> Excuse me. She had no children of her own, but she became a philanthropist, especially for children's and women's charities. And she started a lot of local charities in Hyde Park to help the people there. She started a local Red Cross branch. She started a reading room for women. And at Christmas, she would hand deliver gifts to all the children in the village. Um, in the summer, she'd have big parties on the lawn for the people. And at one point she hired a boat and had about 700 people on a cruise ship take a, dry, a ride up the Hudson. And uh, she also, during the flu epidemic of 1918, paid all the medical bills for the villagers. And in New York City, she established her own charitable organization. It was called the Anthony Home for Working Girls. It was a model residential program for young servants in the wealthy homes of New York City. And at Newport, she began a foundation for the newsboys there who were usually orphans. Her New York Times obituary calls her a charity worker, which I think is New York Times speak for female philanthropist. <laughs> and she left bequests in her will to the Children's Aid Society, to the Sloan Hospital for Women, to the Red Cross, and of course, the ASPCA. And I want to just show you quickly, this is Vanderbilt Mansion. I'm sure you've been there, but it's a beautiful view. This is the Riverside, and this is from the Southeast. Uh, it's a lovely place. And this is Anna Hall Roosevelt. Now she's the mother of Eleanor Roosevelt. She's a lovely woman, and she's part of the next generation of women. At the end of the 19th century, they had awareness of the women's rights movement and also the changing situations in the cities. And they were very concerned about the immigrants and the workers and their needs. So she and others like her cousin, Carrie Astor, got more involved. And instead of just making donations, they raised funds for many new aid organizations in New York. They had charity luncheons and balls and they, they funded a lot of new programs. And she was also very concerned about women's education. Um, there were changes just beginning. Uh, Emma Willard had founded her school up in Troy, and they were trying to get women to be taught academics rather than just the social graces. So Anna was very disappointed with her own education, and she wanted better for her daughter. So she actually started a small school in her home in Manhattan, and she had teachers there with her daughter and a few of her friends. And um, she really wanted... Uh, her daughter to attend a school that she had seen over in England. It was Allenswood School, and it was run by a woman named Madame Suvestre, and it was a very progressive school for young women at the time. But unfortunately, Anna died when she was only 29 years old. She left Eleanor and her brothers to be cared for by her grandmother, and Mary Livingston Ludlow Hall took the children in to Oak Terrace and cared for them. She was also caring still for her own adult children, so she had a house full there. Um, and unfortunately, the younger son, Elliot Jr., died only two years later, followed by his father, Elliot. And so Eleanor lost her 
father and her brother and her mother within the space of two years. Um, but Anna's wishes prevailed. Her mother honored them. She sent Eleanor to Madame Silvestre's school in England. <clears throat> and this had a tremendous influence on Eleanor's thinking. And it really improved her self-confidence and changed her entirely. So this is Oak Terrace. This is the house where Eleanor grew up. This was built by Eleanor's grandparents, and it was built in 1872. And um, her mother and her siblings had grown up there. And Mary Livingston Ludlow Hall was also descended, of course, from Mar Margaret Beekman Livingston and her son, Robert of Claremont. So the property was inherited and was originally part of the Claremont lands. It's a little bit north of the village of Tivoli, but that's how big Claremont's property was in those days. So, and um, if you're interested, it is in private hands. Uh, it just sold for $10 million. So um, unfortunately it's not available for tours. Um, so this is young Eleanor. And I, I love this photo. She's really, uh, she's about 14 or 15 in this photo. And uh, she's a very painfully shy young woman. Her mother's choice of Madame Silvestri's school for her really, provided her with a well-rounded education, gave her a broader view of the world. And so when she returned from England, she joined the next generation of young women who were mobilizing for charities even more directly. Instead of just raising money as her mother had, Eleanor and many other young women took a more active role. They volunteered at the new settlement houses. Eleanor taught at a settlement house on the Lower East Side, and this experience gave her exposure to immigrant families and other people in need. And she introduced her fiance Franklin to these people, and this opened his eyes to the needs of the people as well. And of course, as first lady, despite her innate shyness, she made herself speak for justice and equality, and she had a great influence on FDR's policies. She chaired the committee in the UN that wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights when she was US ambassador to the UN. And there's a quote from Eleanor that I love to share with you. She says, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. So I think she's just an inspiring person. This is the last family I wanna speak about. This is Wilderstein. This is their home the, of the Sukli family. And the Sukli family uh, built the house in 1852, but it was a smaller two-story and it's contained in this house. This house was enlarged by the architect Arno Cannon from Poughkeepsie in 1888. And it was made into the Queen Anne Victorian that it is today. And this is the lady of the manor. This is Bessie Montgomery Sookley. She is um, Daisy Sookley's mother. And she is really living the role still of the Lady Bountiful. She's involved in church groups and charities. She makes donations to many of their family charities. She's always helping relatives and people in need, people in the village. She's also the mother of seven. She lost two sons but she's caring also for her large extended family. I think, I, I don't know if you can see it, but in this photo, I see there's people in, that she's sitting at the window in Wilderstein looking out and there are people milling around in the parlor back there. The house was always full. Daisy talks about how the house was constantly filled with relatives and friends. So Bessie is often exhausted. I mean, there are times when she just has to get a rest and she's she's kind of ill and sometimes exhausted, but. She devotes herself entirely to other people. And this is a letter that I found in the Wilderstein archives, and it is from her sister, Addie. It's January 20, 1921, so it shows that this heritage carries on. Addie says to Bessie, just now you are the one to carry on the old ideas of the Lady Bountiful as successor to Margaret Beekman and our many hardworking and kind-hearted grandmothers. With the country home, it is so lovely to diffuse comfort and be a center as you do. So that shows you who Bessie is, I think. And it tells you that that heritage of Margaret Beekman Livingston really resonated throughout the generations of this family. So this is Daisy. Everyone knows her as Daisy. Her name was actually Margaret, of course. But uh, <laughs> but she this is she's in her 30s. This is 1924 in this in this photo. And um she is the last generation of these women of the great estates. Um, she's the great, great, great granddaughter of Margaret Beekman Livingston. And by now, women's suffrage has passed in 1917, and things are changing. She has a different attitude from her mother. She really wanted to be out in the world. She had a better education than her mother. She had attended Bryn Mawr for two years. 
although her mother didn't want her to finish Bryn Mawr because she thought that would make her unmarriageable. <laughs> but um, she, even though women were better educated at this point, though, they were limited mostly to the caring professions like nursing and teaching until well into the 20th century. So Daisy never marries. Um, it might have been because her family lost a lot of their wealth in the latter part of the 19th century, but she also prizes her independence and she loves to travel. And like Eleanor, she became directly involved in charities. During World War I, she volunteered as a nurse's aide down on Ellis Island at the Army Hospital, and she did fundraising for the war effort. And she became friends with a man that we all know of. Um, this is Daisy with FDR. This is probably the early 30s. They're on the US Sequo Sequoia, the presidential yacht, and they're cruising on the Potomac. That's her niece, Margaret Hamley, sitting to her left. And um, Daisy met FDR through his mother. Sarah had been looking for somebody to sit with him and cheer him on while he was doing exercises for his polio in the 20s when he was stricken with polio. So he and Daisy became good friends. Um, they had similar backgrounds. They discovered they were both, I think, six cousins through Henry Beekman. Um, and all these River families were related, as you can tell. And um, she really enjoyed being out in the world with him. It gave her an opportunity to meet people. She met royalty. She met Churchill. She met a lot of famous people throughout the war years. But she was also a sounding board for him. She was He was able to talk to her and confide in her the way he couldn't with other people. And she also was a caretaker to him in a way. She supported him, but she worried about his health, especially during his last years. She was always seeking other diets and treatments for him, um, but she was with him when he died in Warm Springs. And after her own death, uh, they found a suitcase under her bed at Wilderstein and it contained her diary and letters from him. And it gave a whole picture of their relationship and a lot of insight into their closeness and their friendship. It was compiled into a book by Jeffrey Ward, who's FDR's biographer. It was called Closest Companion. And it's a really wonderful book if you get a chance. But she was surviving uh, and supporting her family through her job at the presidential library. FDR had given her a job there in 1941 when his library opened and she was an archivist. So she was the sole support of her family because by that time, most of their money was gone. The house was kind of falling into ruin. This is Daisy. I believe it's in the mid eighties, this, this picture. And um, she's sitting on the veranda at Wilderstein. And you can, I don't know if you can tell, but the flooring is, every, everything is very worn. And the house hadn't been painted since 1910. So um, things were tough. But she wanted to preserve this place. She loved her family history. She was very proud of it. And so she got some of her River family friends and relatives together, and especially Wint Aldridge of Rokeby, who was a Livingston Astor descendant. And he helped her a great deal to found a preservation that would restore the house and preserve its contents for history. So this, oh, and I should mention, Daisy lived in Wilderstein until her death in 1991, just shy of her 100th birthday. She was a very amazing woman, uh, six months shy of her birthday. So, And she did go ice boating on the Hudson in the 90s. It's another famous Daisy story, amazing woman. Um, so this is Wilderstein as it looks today. This is the South side and you can see the, the big tower, the Queen Anne Tower. And this is, another view. So this is from the, the east side of the house looking south. So you can see their view of the Hudson was quite nice. And this is a view from up in that tower looking down at the Hudson Valley. And you can see, of course, Amtrak running along there, but it's a it's an amazing place, an amazing view. So in closing, I want to tell you that I think that the ladies of the great estates followed their family traditions and cared for their families and their communities but some did expand their roles out into the world. And I think for that, we give them credit. And um, these are my photo credits. I wanna thank the New York State Department of Parks and Recreation and Shelburne Farms and the FDR Presidential Library and the Wilderstein Archives for all their help. And these are the Wilderstein dog houses, just because I like this picture. <laughs> so uh, anybody have any questions? I'd be happy to try to answer. Thank you.
Yes. Were there no great estates or no great ladies on this side of the river? <laughs> you know what? I I found a letter from one of them to someone who lived over here, and the address on the stationery. Uh, I'm sorry, to the, someone from this side of the river. The address address on her stationery was wrong side. Mm. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Serious. It's really? it's yeah. It, it was not cool. <laughs> <laughs> Different now, perhaps. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, a man named Lampru, I believe his name was. He bought it in the interim after that hunting club owned it and wrecked it. Um, he bought it. I he had owned it while I was working on this book, so not that long ago. Um, and he made some renovations to it. He did quite a bit of work on it. Um, and it, it came, it really, he did so much work that um, they were able to sit, stage it, you know, staging is everything, I guess. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. This man, Van, Van Lampru, I think his name is, he bought it from the hunting club or whatever that was. And then he renovated it. Yeah, and that was in the, you know, the, in the teens recently and then they put it on the market originally what i saw the last time i looked was it was they were asking four and a half million then i went again to check and it said sold for 10 million so who knows real estate i don't know <laughs> it's a shame that it's you know well it's a shame that it was let go but luckily it's been restored at least um it's not falling down so um i was no i i no, I didn't get in there. I I've seen pictures of it. I would, I tried to sneak down the. No, I, I, no, I haven't. <laughs> I've seen some photos, huh? You can't see it from the. No, no, no. And there's a gatehouse in front of it that's privately owned, so you really can't go there. Yeah. Yes. How much land comes with this uh, mansion that uh, was just sold? I don't remember what the figure was. Um, it's online. You can, uh, you can see. I I don't think it was that huge. I mean. You know, I it don't know. It was yeah, well, it was kind of a hunting club, but I don't think they hunted there. I think it was just their like their dormitory. They, they kind of wrecked the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know. I don't think it's more than ten acres though. No, it has a view of the river. I mean, it's quite a spectacular view. And it's a beautiful house. Yes. Do we know if Anna Hall and Fanny? Mm. Uh, Roosevelt were friends because it was always my understanding that it was Bammy that got Eleanor to Lady Allwoods in England. Oh, Bammy had gone there. But, yeah, Bam Bammy had gone there. Um, yeah, I think, well, yeah, because Anna had married Elliot. So, yeah, and, and if Bammy was his older sister, so she knew the family. And I yeah. Was, uh, she was the impetus for Eleanor getting to uh, Yeah, no, uh, what I read was that. Um, uh, that Anna had seen the school or had heard of it while she was traveling, perhaps on her honeymoon even, and that she really retained that information about it and wanted to go there. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I know Bammy had gone there as well. It made yeah. all the difference in all of her life. Yeah, it absolutely did. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Oh, Rokeby. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that I have seen. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, it was it was built by uh, Alida Armstrong Livingston and her husband, General um, Armstrong, John Armstrong. Um, and it was originally called La Bergerie, it, it, Sheepfold. And um, then after the Armstrongs um, could, well, they really couldn't maintain it. And so Margaret Armstrong married William Backhouse Astor and he bought the place um, and took it over. Um, the Armstrongs weren't terribly happy about that, but um, they, he let them live there, though. But they renovated it and they made it into the larger house that it is. And um, it is still owned by the family, as you probably know. Um, the Astor family lived in it for many years. Um, and Margaret Armstrong Astor was a contemporary of Margaret Lewis Livingston, who I mentioned. And I find that contrast also interesting because she was very much of a philanthropist in her day. She has a she started a um, home for young women over in Red Hook that still stands. Um, but the house itself was added to over the years. Um, and um, it is still it, it has been 
restore it. I think, I believe they got money from the state to restore some of it. And it does look very good now. I know it has some rough times, but um, it's it's quite amazing. And interiors are all original. It's, it's really a fabulous place. And as I mentioned, Wint Aldrich of Rugby, he was a huge, he was help to me and, in writing this. And he was also a very, very big help to Daisy in starting the Wilderstein Foundation. So it's an amazing place. Yes. Um, with Daisy Sookley's closeness to FDR, I know that they had a very emotionally intimate friendship and obviously she was traveling a lot with him. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is ever a little something else going on? Um, I don't. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, the reason I don't think so is, be well, I think that when they first met, um, there might have been a flirtation because he was a flirtatious man, of course, as we all know. But um, I don't think that she let it go very far because she was she had been recommended to meet him by his mother. She knew Sarah. She knew Eleanor. They were all part of the same social scene. And uh, Daisy would not have let that happen. And um, but I do know that they were very emotionally close. As you say, they're very good friends. And I think that made it easier for him to confide in her because there was no rom romantic entanglement. He could say what he wanted and he could be free with her. And I think that that made all the difference to him. So, yes. She gave him follow. She, well, sort of. Um, <laughs> a woman from Connecticut gave Fala to him. And Daisy trained Fala for him, but yes, <laughs> she and and she used to walk Fala. But I mean, when they traveled, as you said, when they travel on the on the campaign or just cross country trips on the train or whatever, she would be. She said her job was always walking Fala. That's what she did, and um, she kind of diminished herself quite a bit. But um, they were, you know, they were very very good friends. And when they traveled, I mean, it was never the two of them. It was usually with Polly Delano, who was his cousin, who was a flamboyant woman who, um, she she and Daisy were with him the day that he died, as what Lucy Mercer had been there earlier in the day. Um, but Daisy and I think um, he were just very, very good friends. Thanks. Yes. So there were all these very wealthy families that for generations had this incredible wealth accumulated and they all dissipated their wealth. Mm. Were, were there any particular forces that resulted in all of them sort of figuring out like that? Income tax. Well, that was a big part of it. Income tax came in. I mean, you know, um, there was, well, in the case of the Sukli family, it was the panic of 1897. There were various financial panics along the way. Um, and then, of course, the depression. But the income tax made a big difference in their lifestyles. They couldn't maintain these estates and have and the servants. I mean, it was very increasingly harder to get servants. People didn't want to do these jobs. They wanted to be self-sufficient or you know work in in other opportunities so um these places were just anachronistic so i mean some of the money is still floating around out there i'm not saying they're poor but you know it was it was just a different lifestyle entirely thank you so yes did Daisy and Eleanor have any kind of friendship? Oh, well, they they knew each other. I mean, she they yeah, I mean, she Daisy always supported Eleanor. I mean, she she filled in for Eleanor a lot when he had like royalty visiting and Eleanor was out somewhere doing whatever, you know, her work. Um, Daisy would be the hostess and she would fill in. Um, they had a good relationship. I mean, I think Ella, uh, Daisy really respected Eleanor. She writes about how she respects her and, and what she's doing. And I think she gives her credit for being out in the world. Daisy was more reticent. She did not want to be out front but the way Eleanor was. And so, and I, and I think that, um, and I know that Daisy and FDR's daughter, Anna, had a very close relationship, especially toward the end around his health. You know, they were very concerned about him. And um, in fact, Anna was the one who returned his letters to Daisy so she would have them so they wouldn't get lost. So, yeah. Yes. Um, so going back, and you said there were many Livingstons, when you uh, introduced us to Mary, I believe it was Mary Lewis Livingston? Margaret Lewis Livingston, yes. It was Mary, but Mary, okay, Margaret. Mm -hmm. um, 
was her mother a living sin? And then she also married a cousin that was a living sin. Is that how it came? Her father was a Lewis? I mean, it seemed like it's quite it's, inbred. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that. <laughs> she married her, no, Margaret Lewis Livingston of Statsburg. That's who we're talking about? <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry. Um, she was the daughter of Gertrude, who was the daughter of Margaret Beekman Livingston of Claremont. Her father was not a Livingston. He was General Morgan Lewis from Queens. Right. <laughs> so but then she, married she married her cousin from from the manor branch. So they, they felt that it was okay if you were from the other branch, I guess. <laughs> he was a distant cousin and she married him. And um, yeah, I mean, they weren't close cousins, but yeah, distant, yeah, yeah. Genealogy, um, it really, it's tricky, yeah. yeah. So anybody else, any questions? No? Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. <laughs> Mary, thank you so much. And thank you all very much for your questions. We do have Mary's book for sale in the back. Um, and Mary will be sticking around to sign them as well. So we do encourage you to check it out on your exit. Please, again, help yourself to any snacks to go. Um, and thank you so much again for all of your support. Thank you.